I'm super excited to say that today we're going over an opening statement example. We're gonna talk about the good, we're gonna talk about the bad, and we're gonna talk about everything in between. That way you can use this information to go kill it on game day. But first, we gotta roll that intro. Welcome to Law Venture, my name's Jarrett Stone. If you're new to this channel, I recommend that you take several steps before watching the rest of this video on opening statements. Step one, download this mini ebook. It's the 10 step formula to the perfect opening statement. If you wanna get it sent directly to you, it's free, it's instant, then go in the description, click the link, it'll take you to my website, type in your email address, and boom, you got it. Now step two, that's the most important step. Don't skip this step. You need to subscribe. I think that's down here or, or maybe over here. Now step three, you need to check out this video about opening statements that I made as well. It's either there or maybe, it, maybe it's there. But check it out and use that in conjunction with the mini ebook that you just downloaded in step one. Now step four is optional because you may wanna watch the opening statement in its entirety without all the pauses, the stops, and my commentary. That way you can get a real feel for basically the pace of the opening statement and the overall presentation. If that's you and if that's what you wanna do, then I'll go ahead and slide maybe up here or up there the YouTube video from a different YouTube channel. You can check it out, you can watch it, and you can get that feel for it. And truthfully, I, I don't know if it's up here or up there. I'm still trying to get a little oriented with this whole pointing thing in YouTube. But either way, go ahead and check it out. Maybe open up a new tab and I'll just, I'll wait right here. Okay, and we're back. And if nobody actually clicked that link and I was just pausing by myself, that's a little awkward. But either, either way, let's go ahead and dive into this opening statement example. Morning. 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 On Monday, October 27th, 2008, Tina Corona's dead body was found stuffed in the back of her Chevy Avalanche truck. So let's stop for a second and talk about this introduction because the introduction I think is very, very important. For those that have downloaded the ebook, there, there we go. And for those that have watched the YouTube video, they know I recommend that you first say, may it please the court, counsel, and then members of whatever county or members of the jury, that way it brings some type of unification to the jury. They all start thinking that they're a team and you plant that psychological seed that, hey, we're all in this together and we all need to reach the same verdict. And in the prosecutor sense, it's the verdict of a conviction of the defendant. Also notice that she is immediately diving into this opening statement by bringing the fire, by bringing the explosions. And while she's not being very dramatic in her presentation. I actually really like the way she's presenting. It's very calm and it's very clear. And that's, that's a powerful combination, especially during opening statement. But I disagree with just coming in so heavy handed to the jury. And here's why. The jury's paying attention. There's no doubt in my mind. I know most lawyers, they wanna go ahead and bring the fire and the explosions in order to catch the jury's attention. But if you notice, the entire courtroom is packed. It's a packed house in the back. There's a camera from the angle we're looking at. There's a camera on the opposite side and it's a murder trial. The stakes could, probably couldn't be higher. I don't, I don't know if they can be higher. And so the jury not only wants to do a good job, but they wanna do the right thing. In fact, most juries wanna do the right thing. So they're paying attention. The only time you'll start losing the jury is if you start being boring or your opening statement goes on too long. Now. What I would have liked to have seen from the prosecutor, I, I love her presentation, but the fact that she skipped the introduction, she didn't even introduce herself, I think she's missing out on a very key element of this opening statement. Even if she was able to introduce herself during jury selection or voir dire for the fancy folks, I would have liked for her to incorporate some tidbits or maybe some golden nuggets that she was able to get during jury selection and put that in the beginning of her opening statement because that would provide much smoother continuity between jury selection and opening statement. And doing so would put the jury in the frame of mind that they're along on the ride of the, on this train and the prosecutor is essentially the conductor. 
And what this does is this makes opening statement basically step two in this process in the jury's mind instead of step one. You see, if you have jury selection and that is step one and then you come in with a different tone and you don't have that continuity in your opening statement, then you don't want the jury to erase everything that they learned and every impression that was made from jury selection and then start fresh again. Instead, if you were able to have a really good jury selection, don't waste that. Basically, proceed to where this opening statement that you're making is step two. And they know that you're gonna take them through all the remaining steps to the ultimate conclusion. So I know that's hyper-technical, but my recommendation is to develop that type of credibility because that is king in the courtroom. And you can do that very, very early on in your opening statement. And truthfully, Credibility in the courtroom is a lot like sales. Let's say you're in the market for a new basketball shoe. You may go to the store and some salesperson is pitching you why you should buy this particular shoe. But you're not super convinced that that's the right shoe for you. You don't know the salesperson. You don't know their qualifications. You know they sell shoes, that's their job, and maybe they get a commission for it. And then you go online. You open up a tab, you look at a shoe, you kind of like it, you look at the reviews, you look at the specs, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go look at my other options. Then you click a new tab, you do the exact same thing over and over and over again, and then you maybe figure out what you want. It takes you a while to get there, but you ultimately get there. Now, let's say your favorite basketball player happens to be Michael Jordan or LeBron James, and one of them releases a brand new shoe you're much more likely, if that's your favorite person, if you have their poster up or you have their rookie card, to go purchase that shoe, especially if you're in the market for a shoe. And the reason for that is because you know and you trust your favorite basketball player. If your favorite basketball player is wearing this shoe, you know that shoe is good enough for them, it's most likely good enough for you. This is basically how trial works when it comes to credibility. The jury knows that at the end of the day, they're gonna to have to reach a decision. One way or the other, they're gonna to have to, in this particular case, in a criminal case, say guilty or not guilty. And if you can develop that credibility early on with the jury, you can streamline that decision-making process because they're gonna start trusting every word that comes out of your mouth. And if you can do that, then you're well on your way to winning the case. But enough, enough of that rant. Let's go ahead and dive back into this opening statement. We didn't get very far and I ended up ranting a little bit. I apologize, but let's get back to it. The avalanche was found parked on the side of the road on a neighborhood, dead end street in Bartlett. And the state's proof will show that the defendant, Joe Corona, killed his wife, Tina, stuffed her back behind the front and back seats of that truck and left her parked on the side of the road. Now why, what would make a husband kill his wife? It's because the proof will show you that for years the defendant had been living a lie and Tina was about to find out and he could not let that happen. So let's hit the pause button real quick. I wanna acknowledge that she's well-spoken and that's super impressive given the fact that with trial, there's just pressure. But with a murder trial and everything that's going on in this, especially video, but in this environment, is super, super stressful. And so the fact that she's so well-spoken, props to her. I also wanna address that she's very clear in her message. And if the jury can understand the message because it's clear, then you're killing it with your opening statement. My critique though, we have yet to hear a theme. With the theme, you develop continuity during the entire course of the trial. And as the theme keeps being brought up over and over again, the jury thinks, okay, things are going to plan just like this prosecutor or this lawyer said during their opening statement. So the fact that the prosecutor is claiming that the defendant is a liar, a theme that could have been used is maybe like a mask, right? The defendant, when he's out and about, has a mask on and he looks like an average Joe. He acts like an average person. But once the mask comes off, then he's a totally different person. You really see him for what he is. And that theme could be very, very powerful because let's say the defense you know, has testimony, um, has exhibits, witnesses, whatever, that is all trying to back up the defendant and paint the defendant in a favorable light. Well, the prosecutor can 
use that theme and continue it by saying, that's just the mask on. They haven't seen the real side and potentially discredit all that testimony and all that evidence. Just, just a thought, just my two cents. Let's go ahead and dive back in. Now let's talk about Saturday, October 25th. A couple days earlier, the day that Tina died. Tina and Joe had been married for about 15 years. They were members of the Corvette Club. And you'll hear testimony that Tina was a bubbly, outgoing personality. She loved people and she loved to entertain. And on this particular Saturday night, there was a big Corvette Club party planned. Tina was in charge of bringing the tables and coolers and the food and the drinks. Now, the day before on Friday, she had gone and picked up those tables and coolers. And you are going to hear from the person that was with her and saw and helped her put those tables and coolers into the back of that very same Chevy Avalanche truck. That's going to become very important. Now we know that her plan for Saturday was to go shopping at Costco and Sam's and get supplies for the party, the food and the drinks. And you'll hear testimony that around 9 o'clock that morning, she talked to her friend, Pat Hathaway. They talked about the party. Pat asked Tina if she needed any help with the shopping. Tina said no because the defendant was going to go help her do the shopping, which you'll hear was not unusual because you'll hear from more than one witness that Tina and the defendant did lots of things together. They went shopping. He took her to nail appointments. He took her to routine doctor's visits. He even went with her when she tried to spend time with her son, Todd, a son she had from a previous marriage. So it wasn't unusual that the defendant would be the one to go with Tina to do the shopping. You also hear that around 10.15 that morning, she talked to Matt Struna. Now Matt and his wife were also members of the Corvette Club and they were hosting the party that night. So they were coordinating when Tina was gonna bring the food and drinks by. He also asked her if she needed any help. She said no. And Matt Struna was the last person besides the defendant to talk to Tina on Saturday, October 25th. You'll hear testimony that that morning and he came outside in his driveway and he pulled that very same black Chevy Avalanche truck into the garage and then he shut the door. Now the defendant says that he was loading those tables in the back of the truck. The table that she picked up on Friday. So a couple thoughts. Notice that the jury, they have pin and pat. And so that's a really good indicator to determine whether or not you have the jury's attention, whether or not the jury is engaged with what you're saying. So if they have their head down, but they're writing, that means they're taking notes, that means they're listening. If they kind of have a glazed look over, you may need to wake them up, you may need to walk closer to them or change your location by walking to the other side of the well or the courtroom, or you may need to have a dramatic pause, kind of like that. But speaking of walking, my one critique is notice that her walking isn't really with a purpose. You always want to walk with a purpose. If I, if I had more room in this video, I'd try and show you. But typically when you walk, you want to go from one point to the other point when you're making different points or whenever you want to stress something. And I also recommend if the jury's taking notes and you see that they're engaged, then make it easy for them by letting them know what to write down. You don't have to say, now write that down. But you know, have that dramatic pause that gives them time to write something down or just flat out say, now this is important and then go into what's important. Also, just as a final thought, as I'm just flushing all this uh, information and, and commentary out, if she's going to dive into all these dates and all these names, then I would have liked for her to basically have a slide that makes it really easy for the jury to understand what date's important because she goes from Saturday and then she talks about 15 years ago getting married. So my mind immediately goes 
back in time and then she goes back up to Saturday or the Friday before and what's all going there and and the, the timeline gets a little fuzzy and if you mention dates make sure you're mentioning dates because it's important don't mention dates just for the sake of mentioning dates because when people hear dates then they think it is important so they start trying to you know focus on these particular dates but if you're doing that and focusing on that but you're really trying to talk about something else then they're focusing on the wrong thing so you want to make it clear which i hope i hope this is clear um, by maybe having a powerpoint presentation of like okay here's the timeline of events and here are the witnesses that are going to talk about that and you may want to outline on a powerpoint slide the witnesses as well because if you're naming witnesses and they can't and the jury can't visualize the face of the witness then you know a week from now when the trial still going on they're not going to remember that you said okay um joe smith was supposed to testify about x y and z and then joe smith comes up and they're like oh there he is that's, that's kind of a hard thing to remember but if you can if they, especially if they're taking notes if you can give them that powerpoint presentation that walks them through that timeline then you can kind of write it down and refer to it whenever joe smith does get up on the stand and, and say oh that, that that's what that lawyer said okay this is where we're at now um, and then that brings again more continuity and gives you more credibility. All right, enough of that. Let's dive back in. And you also hear that that truck backed out of the driveway and left around 11 a.m. or 12 noon. You also hear testimony from Gary Hathaway. Gary is Pat Hathaway's husband, also members of the Corvette Club, and he's going to tell you about a phone call he received around 11.30 that morning. The phone call was from the defendant. And the defendant wanted to know if he could come over to Gary's house and work on one of his old classic cars. In particular, the red Chevelle. And Gary said that was fine. The defendant said, well, it will just, it'll take me a little while to get there because I have to go get it. And Mr. Hathaway explained that when the defendant said that, he knew exactly what he meant. So let's pump the brakes real quick. Notice that the prosecutor is referring to the defendant as the defendant and not by name. No, the defendant probably isn't the man who shall not be named. Instead, the, the prosecutor is most likely using a trial tactic that makes the defendant less sympathetic or less relatable if he doesn't have a name. He meant he had to drive out to Bartlett to where he had a storage unit. <clears throat> He had a few units where he stored four of his classic cars, including the Red Chevelle. A storage unit that just so happens to be less than half of a mile from where Tina's body was found. So here's a hyper-technical critique. She just dropped a bomb of a fact. The defendant's storage unit was super close by the victim's body. If I'm a juror, that's powerful stuff. The problem, she didn't really deliver it in a powerful way. I know this is opening statement and this isn't closing, but this type of fact needs to be delivered ultra clearly and it needs to have that emphasis, that punch. The problem, and you may have to rewind it and watch it, as the prosecutor's telling this part of the story, telling this fact, She's kind of walking away and she's not really locking eyes with the jury. At this point in time, I wish she would have just stopped and she would have paused, made sure everyone's paying attention to her, and she would have maybe asked a rhetorical question in order to answer that rhetorical question with this bomb of a fact. And doing so would have basically heightened everyone's attention and then just absolutely maximized just blowing everyone's mind. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting chills thinking about it. Okay, en enough of that, let's, let's get back into it. Now the defendant says that he never went out to the storage unit that morning. But you're gonna hear from the cell phone tower expert who will tell you what his phone records tell us for real. Now there will also be testimony from the Hathaway, Mr. Hathaway that the defendant showed up at Mr. Hathaway's house around one o'clock that afternoon and he stayed till about four o'clock. And it was after that, after four o'clock that afternoon, that the defendant made his very first phone call <coughs> to Tina. 
Now again, you're going to hear testimony from more than one witness that on a typical day, Tina and the defendant talked multiple times throughout the day, checking in. Specifically, you'll hear from her co-workers. Sometimes he would call her work phone back to back, and if she wouldn't answer, cell phone in her purse would ring. It was the defendant calling. But on Saturday, October 25th, his first phone call wasn't until a little after 4 o'clock that afternoon. A little after 5, the Hathaways get a call from the defendant saying, Tina's not home, I think she's missing, I'm really worried. And they end up going over to his house to help search for her that evening. Now this is a man that goes to the nail salon, to the gynecologist, that calls her multiple times a day, and yet he doesn't call the police. They search all night, can't find the avalanche, nobody's heard from Tina. So Sunday they get a group together of all the Corvette Club members, and they organize a, a big search. They have flyers, they split up in groups. No Tina, no avalanche. Not until Monday, October 27th. So maybe this is just me, but again, I wish you would have had a PowerPoint with a timeline so we can know where we were. And I also wish she would have emphasized the fact that 48 hours has passed, a lot of time has passed. By simply saying Monday, that, that doesn't really emphasize the fact that somebody has been missing since Saturday. 48 hours have gone by and nobody's heard a word. You don't have to be ultra dramatic about it, but 48 hours has a little bit more of a punch than just saying Monday. It allows somebody to conceptualize the time a little bit more. Okay, back in. October 27th, when Bartlett police found that back black avalanche parked on the side of the road in Bartlett, less than half a mile from where the defendant stores four of his cars. Now earlier, I told you the proof would show that the defendant had been living a lie. Well, he'd actually been living two. First of all, for the last eight to ten years, he'd been having an affair with a woman named Becky Black. An affair that Tina found out about in the beginning, but thought was over. An affair that the defendant not only planned on continuing after Tina died, he did continue after Tina died. A relationship the defendant thought was going to last forever. He thought Becky was going to leave her husband and spend the rest of her life with him. And you'll hear testimony that when he realized that was not going to be the case, he became obsessed and angry and upset because he didn't know how to handle it. The other lie that he'd been living was a financial one. Tina thought they were doing fine financially. They lived in a nice house. You'll hear testimony she loved to shop. She loved shoes. They went on lots of vacations together. She made a subs substantial amount of money. She thought Joe was making a lot of money. Joe was an investment <coughs> agent, except he'd been stealing and defrauding several of his clients for several years. What they would do is write him a check for five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, and instead of sending that check to the investment company, the defendant would keep the money and deposit it in his own bank account. That is not a good fact. If I'm the defense, I'm sweating bullets right now. I'm actually surprised the prosecutor brought that up during opening statement. I, the, I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but most likely there was a motion in limine, and I'm assuming the defense lost and that was able to come in, but wow, that's hard hitting stuff. And this is the exact reason why you wanna have a theme. This would, would have been a great time to mention the whole mask on, mask off situation because in the public eye, he's going on vacations, he's living this lavish life, he's making a lot of money, they're doing really well, the wife thinks that as well. But then behind the scenes, when the mask comes off, he's stealing money and he's putting it in, in the pocket and he's not doing nearly as well. That would've been a great time to really kind of, I guess, have that continuity with the theme throughout this opening statement and continued it as testimony and evidence came forth. 
All right, enough. We're diving back in. <clears throat> and nobody knew, not even Tina. But she was about to find out. Because you see, Monday, October 27th, was a big day. They were supposed to be closing on a brand new house. A house out in Bay County cost $440,000. But this was a closing that would never happen. The defendant never intended on them closing on this house. And you'll hear from more than one witness who will tell you, there is no way that house could have closed on Monday, October 27th. And yet the defendant told people they were closing and led the victim, Tina, to believe they were closing on Monday. Because he knew if she had seen all those loan documents where it lays out all of the debts, all of the assets, she thought their house was paid off, she thought a lot of their debts were paid off. And there would have been the reality looking right at her. She would have asked and figured out the reality of their finances. She would have learned about the fraud. And then he was going to lose complete control of everything. Lose his wife. Lose his friends. His lifestyle. Going to jail. Couldn't let it happen. So Saturday, October 25th, he killed Tina. Stuffed her back behind that front seat. Drove out to Bartlett parked that car on the side of the road, and walked less than half a mile to a storage unit and got one of his cars and left. You're going to be hearing a lot of testimony and a lot of witnesses over the next couple of weeks. I want you to try and focus on using three tools as you try and piece all <coughs> of this evidence and testimony together. First, I want you to get your facts and the evidence from right here. The people that sit in this chair can tell you. This is where you get your evidence from. It doesn't come from me or from any of the other lawyers sitting right here. It comes from these people. You can get your law. You can get that from the judge. Easy to tell you what it is and how to apply it. And finally, I want you to use something you all came in here with before today. Your common sense. Don't forget about it. It's important. Use it when you go back there and you start deliberating going through all that evidence. And at the end of it all, you'll be able to say that the defendant, Joe Corona, is guilty of first degree murder. Overall, I think she did a great job with her opening statement. It was very convincing and she's very well spoken and she was very articulate while she was presenting this opening statement. And I actually like that she kept it relatively short compared to, you know, hour and a half opening statements which are ridiculous. But I do want to critique a couple more things, not because I'm negative, but because I think the positives are pretty obvious and for the sake of time of this video not running too long let's just kind of dive into these negatives and turn them into gold nuggets so that you can have a better opening statement notice that she didn't mention the burden of proof at all this is super important especially in a criminal trial when the burden is so high for the prosecutor i really hope they were able to bring this up during jury selection or voir dire or maybe this state has a different rule when it comes to the burden of proof but my biggest recommendation is to mention the burden of proof, even if you talked about it ad nauseum during jury selection. The reason for that is you want to show the jury how these facts that I just talked about can apply to the burden and why they satisfied the burden and why the jury's job is going to be so simple and so straightforward. That makes the jury feel a little bit better about their jobs given the gravity of the situation, especially whenever it's exponentially heightened with the murder trial. And finally, this last critique is more of a stylistic thing. I would have presented the facts in a totally different way and kind of overhauled it a little bit, but this is just me. I would have originally focused solely on the defendant's actions and conduct with his mask off. I would have talked about what he's actually like, all the lies and all the negatives. And then after basically exposing the defendant for the type of person that he is, 
So ultimately, I would tell the story of the victim. I would personalize her and allow the jury to develop sympathy. And since I had already talked about the negatives and the lies and all the bad stuff about the defendant when his mask is off, the jury knows as you're telling this story of the victim that it ends tragically. So they start developing more and more sympathy. And they know that as you're telling the victim's story that the defendant's mask is on. And so they are just developing potentially this animosity already towards the defendant. And to make the sympathy more concrete, I may even point in the crowd and point out the family members and the loved ones of the victim to really, really hammer that home. Now, I say all that, but at the end of the day, having or delivering an opening statement can be super stressful. And so I recommend that you practice, practice, practice. And that way you can stick to this story and to this opening statement that you're trying to present to the jury. And that way you can effectively do it. I also recommend that you have an outline. That way, if you go on a rant or tangent, like I tend to do, or if you just space out for a second, then you know to come back to home base, which is your outline. And you know to move on to the next step, which all the steps are outlined. There we go. All the steps are outlined right there. Free download below. And if you have any questions about what we just went over, feel free to leave them in the comments. Or if you have any critiques about my critiques, feel free to leave those in the comments as well. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. What are you doing? All right, I'll see y'all in the next video.